no, 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 you bastard, you bastard. Oh no, 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 don't you dare. Oh, come off it. Morning. And it's died again. No! Morning! Hello! Morning! Watch your YouTube! Thank you! This Thank review's you not going so well. Cheers guys, thank you. Let these guys do what they're doing. Pull it over to the left. Hello everybody. The history of British cars is filled with names sadly no longer with us. And today I'm looking at what could be one of the greatest cars ever to come from a car maker, no longer around, the Jensen Interceptor. The ingredients that go into making a Jensen Interceptor are near perfection. The styling is Italian by Carrozzeria Touring. The power is American by Chrysler. And it was assembled by the British at a time when our cars were some of the most desirable in the world. This was the era of the Mini, the E-Type Jag and the Aston Martin DB5. It is an odd looking duck, I will confess, but I kind of like it. In the flesh, it's got presence, even if it is a rather odd mashup of Capri and Mustang at the front with Pacer and Gremlin vibes at the back. This particular car is a Mark III Interceptor and came from 1973. Up front, you will find a 440 cubic inch Chrysler V8, 7.2 litres in metric, and that produces a rather modest 250 horsepower. Remember, this is from the era when all big American V8s have been totally nerfed by new and much stricter emissions regs. Only a few years earlier, engines like that were making a genuine 400 horsepower. That engine is paired with by far the most common transmission option, a three-speed torque flight automatic. A four-speed manual was also available, but I'm told is very rare and may not have been an option by the time this car was in production. Jensen was also not a company without ambition, because the Interceptor spawned the very similar looking FF, the first production car in the world with four-wheel drive that wasn't a purpose-built off-roader, and they produced that between 1966 and 1971. Unfortunately, during the design process, nobody had the foresight to realise that people around the world would be interested in such a car. So when they built it, they made it only available in right-hand drive not thinking that actually most of your customers for a four-wheel drive variant would actually be in left-hand drive territories. For that reason, they only shifted a few hundred of them. Not that this ever sold in great quantities either. It was always a big, expensive and luxurious car, not aimed to sell in great numbers. But the economic conditions of the 1970s, combined with the relative failure of the more affordable Jensen Healey sports car, meant that in May 1976, Jensen closed its doors for good, with just under 6,500 of these having found a home. The interior of the Interceptor is wonderful in the way that only an old British car can be. It has a very distinct smell, in the same way that all 1990s Japanese cars smell the same, so do all 1970s British cars. Why and how, I do not know, and I don't want to know. The materials quality in here is generally quite high. Naturally, there are plenty of ashtrays, but you've also got some real creature comforts, like electric windows that work really quickly and really well. There are plenty of gauges, you've got voltage, fuel, oil pressure, temp, and then of course, speed and revs. The red line is just over 5,000 RPM. That engine is not exactly a screamer. In the center here, you've got a rather cheap and nasty surround for the gear selector, but this all works well. It's fairly intuitive. You even have air conditioning as well. And the only thing in here that looks really out of place is this very nasty 1990s head unit. Beyond that, it's spectacular. Rear seat room though, for a car this large, is very compromised. You'd get kids in the back, but not very big ones. 
Over the years, a number of attempts were made to revive the Jensen name, but none of them really stuck. There is a Resto Mod Interceptor available, but this one, barring a colour change from bright orange to this rather striking blue, is original. It was bought in 2000 by Paul, and today is maintained by his wife and son, Liz and James, who have kept it and decided to have it as a bit of a memento and something they can use and enjoy. I'm very grateful to them for bringing it out to me today, and so I suppose now it's time to see just what this iconic British car is really like. I absolutely love this car, even if at present it is determined to be very British. An hour we drove this for to get it to my filming location and it did not skip a beat. Then we do our drive-bys and just as we're about to finish, it starts running rough. It would appear a sense of timing is one of this car's many fine qualities. I think the last time I actually ever saw an Interceptor out and about was at a car show, and there it announced its arrival with a cloud of steam. As you may have guessed it, this is another one of many British cars whose cooling system has proven to be its Achilles heel. In truth, if you were expecting to own a car of this type and vintage without the odd niggle, you're always going to be disappointed. And if you can look past that kind of stuff, there is an awful lot to really love about the Interceptor. I tend to classify any car from sort of 1980 onwards as modern. 1990s cars essentially are brand new ones as far as I'm concerned. After all, last time I checked, the 90s was only 10 years ago. Get in something from the 80s and though the plastics may be a little bit out of date and there's nowhere to put your CDs, they're still pretty easy cars to generally just get in and drive. By the time you get to the 1970s, things are quite different. The 60s even more so. Yet this really does give me the vibe of a much later car than it actually is. Okay, the interior is still pure 1970s. I love the four ashtrays. Two up front for mum and dad, two in the back for the kids. Don't worry though, they're only kiddie size ones. It is the sense of quality that I get from this car, which is really one I did not expect. The doors shut nicely. The boot feels incredibly solid. Almost, dare I say it, Germanic. The other way this car feels quite modern is in its sizing. Many cars of the 1960s and 70s are positively tiny. This is not. A Lotus Elan would be dwarfed by the Interceptor. An E-Type feels about a foot narrower, and in reality probably is quite a bit narrower. I suppose part of that may have been to make you feel like you got what you'd paid for. When new, this cost over £5,000. That was enough to buy a Jaguar E-Type 2 Plus 2 and another car, or an Aston Martin DB6 and have change. They were pricey when new, but today they're shockingly affordable. Okay, the example I found in the classifieds is £75,000, but if you were to compare that with, say, a contemporary E-Type, a, a nice one, not a later one, an old 911 would command at least this money and feel nowhere near as majestic, and as for old Ferraris and Lamborghinis, <laughs> forget it. There is also something desperately cool about being able to say you drive a Jensen Interceptor, which doesn't seem to want to be able to idle, and now I'm at the literally worst place possible. Oh, come on. Do not dare stall here, do not dare. It's definitely missing now, isn't it? Old cars, eh? There's power steering in this as well, which I do not want to die on me. I have a suspicion the carburetors are playing up. That definitely sounds to me like a fueling issue. With a quarter of the tank allegedly still there, there should be plenty in the car. The truth is, this was never really a car that had a great big surge at the top end anyway, or at least didn't feel like that. It's very much a sort of low RPM type affair. Oh, I don't want to have to turn it around again already. I'm going to go a little bit further before I do that, because I know almost certainly this is going to stall. Why are you doing that? Stop complaining. Oh, birdie, please don't. 
The brakes are pretty decent. The tyres, you may have heard chirping there, they are discs all round, rather innovative. For early discs, they actually work really well. You can even, within reason, throw it into a bend. The steering is beautiful, wonderfully communicative, and the car is soft, supple. This is a proper GT. It went clear. No, 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 you bastard, you bastard. I actually believe something really, really stupid is probably going on, like a fuel filter issue or, or something like that, because, see, now, running like a dream. I shall attempt to remain professional and do my best. These cars are sent to test us. It has, in its entire life, this car, done only 21 and a half thousand miles. That's not many, is it? I was speaking with James, who's currently unable to drive this car very frequently because of insurance, and he's really looking forward to getting some more miles behind him in it. Oh no, 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 no. I am currently doing the cruelest thing imaginable, which is essentially riding the car on the brake with the throttle, which I doubt it's going to like me very much for. The temperature gauge is certainly higher than it was earlier. Now I'm going to try and get a bit of a clear run, higher speed, and also I'm going to turn the heater up too full, old school tactics, but hey, they work. And it's died again. <sighs> no! Morning! So, what I am doing now is known in the industry as tempting fate. It's about four hours after you last saw me. In that time, I have taken James and Liz, whose car this is, off to a nice pub lunch. We've let it relax for a couple of hours. They've then filled it up with Shell V power, driven it for about an hour, in which time it has been absolutely fine. But I drove it for about an hour earlier, and it was absolutely fine. Then it was not. Let's see if I can get this video done before it starts playing up again. So, trying vaguely to get back onto the review, I should mention that fuel economy is atrocious. In period, it was quoted as about 12 to the gallon, and there's a chance that could be an optimistic figure. This is without a doubt one of the things that led to the demise of the Interceptor. There was never even the option of a more economical engine. It was V8 or bust. Special mention should also be given not just to Liz and James for allowing me to drive this piece of family heritage, but also the lovely trio of lads who helped me out when the car conked out earlier. I don't know your names, really sorry, didn't get them, but they're channel fans and all around really good people. So if you're watching, thank you so very much. You made my day at a point where it was at its lowest. Farmer's got a sprinkler there, that could be quite handy. Oh yes, that's an intercooler water spray, and also I don't know how to do the wipers on this thing. There we go. All right, other things about the Jensen Interceptor, the wipers are useless. <laughs> While it's not boiling over, and there's a straight bit of road, I'll put my foot down. Oh, she's much happier now, much, much happier. Still not that keen to rev out. I got to about three and a bit thousand RPM, then kind of lost interest. I don't think the gearbox helps, and I'm pretty sure the carbs on this also need a little bit of adjustment. They may have been partly responsible for what was going on earlier. I love carbs on cars when they work, but I'll be honest, they're one of the things that if I own this car, I wouldn't worry about saying goodbye to. I know some people are wedded to them. I'd put fuel injection on this, modern electronic ignition, because that's just going to mean the car is a little bit more reliable. I'm sure there are some who would be aghast at the idea and think you're simply losing all of the car's character. No, for me, losing a little bit of character, if you want to call it that, is a price I'm willing to pay in order to be able to trust the car to get you from A to B. And what a way to get from A to B it is. It is spectacular, this car. Also, rather wide and daunting on this narrow little road. It's comfortable, it's plush, it's luxurious. It is a seriously cool car. The tyres on it are period specification Pirelli P4000s. Never heard of those before. The 6000s I'm familiar with, not so much the 4000. You will find its limits fairly quickly, but the truth is this car seems at its happiest bimbling. 
I know that might not sound like the sort of thing you want to do in a 7.2 litre V8, but tis true. Oh yes, car's much, much happier now. I do also have the heater and fan on, not quite full blast, but they're on old school tactic to try and keep the thing cooler for just a little bit longer. Genuinely, this is the sort of thing where I just wouldn't resto mod it. I really like it. I'm pretty sure the engine is fundamentally reliable. It's the stuff around it that's not so much. So if I had one of these, yes, upgrade the heck out of your cooling system, your injection, your fuel delivery system, get that to modern standards. You've kept most of the character of the car, but you've added significantly to the reliability. And that's only ever a good thing. Public reaction to the car is absolutely sensational. And on that note, I also need to say a big hello to Erin and Alex. I don't know who you are, but hello. I get requested that a lot these days, shout outs for people. It's nice to do, but to be honest, I, I like it, I enjoy it. And I like this car. The seats are really, really good. I apologize if I'm sort of doubling up on things I may have said earlier, but as you probably noticed, it was a little bit of a flustered morning. I suppose in reality, what I've been given here is the full Interceptor experience. All the lovely, big, throaty V8 noises, the glamorous looks, but also the crippling unreliability that really put the entire British car industry to bed. Suspension, by the way, is independent wishbones at the front, but a live axle at the rear. So handling on the limit I expect is of the classic variety. Mustang fans, I'm sure, would very much like it. And perhaps unsurprisingly, I feel like it's some of the American cars I've driven before that feel closest to this. An Aston Martin DB6 is a more difficult car to drive, more engaging in some ways. The manual gearbox I much prefer over this old school dim-witted auto, but it's a very, very heavy steer and not particularly pleasant to pilot around town. Though I whinge about it, the Autobox actually does make this car even more enjoyable to simply drive slowly, because it's much happier doing that. It is also vastly better put together than anything American of the period I've experienced. Old Mustangs, Corvettes and all that, they look very, very cool. They were much cheaper cars in period, but they do feel it. Actually, the only other thing I would change about this car is the uh, awful CD player down here. Cassettes or an 8-track, I think, are the only order of the day here. Like a Jag, everybody will let you out when you're at the wheel of a Jensen, and that is helpful because occasionally you might feel like you can't stop. The brakes are actually better than expected, but very spongy and not particularly fearsome. The gauges appear to all be more or less where they should, although earlier they were all where they should as well, which is why I feel like it could be a fuel issue rather than simply classic overheating. The temp gauge never got even close to the red. But I'm sure at some point soon the car's going to go off to its specialist and they'll tell me what's wrong with it. Apparently, servicing and running one of these is not a particularly cheap endeavour, but are you surprised? Just glorious. And what a day to enjoy the car. And here's the really, really important thing. Here's the measure of a classic car. Yes, for not the first, but one of the very few times in a thousand videos I was stranded by a car. And this is the important thing. I forgive it. I love it. No! No! I was just saying nice things about you! Oh shit, now I'm really in somewhere I don't want to be. I get the message, you're unhappy, we're going to take you back to your owners. That's my cue to get out of here. If you've enjoyed watching me suffer at the hands of a Jensen Interceptor, please do hit the like button, comment down below. If you want to see more cars like this on the channel, tell me. Even better, if you've got a car like this that works and you're happy for me to drive it, please drop me a line. My email address is in the description of every video. For now though, please hit that like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, hit the bell icon so you're notified of upcoming videos, and I'll see you all for the next one. Bye bye.